Got it. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. All right. So over to you, Paige. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. Um, yep. Yep. It is. I can. Uh, yep. You might just need to. I might just give you the thumbs up when I need a slide okay. change. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi everyone. My name is Paige. I'm a PhD candidate in pre-crew, the pre-hospital resuscitation and emergency care research unit, where I'm conducting a mixed method thesis on ambulance-attended falls across WA from an epidemiological and health services perspective. So today I'll go through just a brief background on falls, the aims of my research, uh, some of my preliminary results and the progress of each of the four studies I'm completing for my thesis. So as of 2017, there were more than one in seven Australians over 65 years of age, and this number is rising. So given this increasing proportion of older adults, uh, this suggests that there will be an increased incidence in what is already Western Australia's leading cause of injury-related hospitalizations for people over 65 years of age. So when someone falls and calls triple zero for an ambulance, the Ambulance Communication Centre will follow the Medical Priority Dispatch System to collect details, allocate a priority at which an ambulance needs to be dispatched to the patient via. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, once paramedics arrive, they will assess the patient and determine how urgently, if at all, that patient needs to be transported to hospital. So, as I said earlier, I'm looking to investigate ambulance attended falls across Western Australia via four key objectives or four studies. The first of which uh, is a systematic scoping review of literature. Okay. <laughs> scoping review of literature that is describing patients who fall and are attended by emergency medical services. Secondly, a retrospective cohort study where I'm aiming to describe the characteristics of ambulance attended patients who fall, their injury, pre-hospital interventions and patient disposition using St. John WA data. Now, when I refer to patient disposition, I'm referring to what goes on at the end of the interaction between that patient and the paramedic. So was that patient transported? Did they refuse travel? Did they not require transport? What went on at the end of that interaction? Thirdly, a retrospective cohort study to evaluate patients who sustained repeat falls identified in the previous cohort study. And finally, a qualitative phenomenological study looking to explore and develop a rich and comprehensive understanding of the experience of paramedics attending and managing patients who fall. And this is qualitative as my primary data source is semi-structured interviews. So there are four conceptual categories that really tie all of these studies together, and they include patient characteristics, injuries sustained, pre-hospital interventions, and patient disposition. So you'll hear me talk about all four of these things throughout the presentation today. So the first study, which is the scoping review, is actually in the process of being published. So my supervisors and I have completed this study. And after reviewing 9,280 titles and abstracts, we have found 115 peer-reviewed sources that report on the management of adults who have fallen and were attended by emergency medical services. So 48 of these 115 studies looked exclusively at adults who had fallen and the additional 67 reported on a subgroup of people who had fallen. So this included trauma studies looking at motor vehicle incidents, assaults and falls, and ultimately still gave us information regarding the management of adults who have fallen. Now, these 115 sources came from 16 different countries and spanned from 1988 all the way to 2021. So we really feel that we have captured the breadth of pre-hospital research regarding falls. So the results are telling us that patient characteristics and injuries are well documented 
although there is a gap of detailed information surrounding EMS interventions delivered in the pre-hospital setting. Being transported to a major trauma centre is associated with being male, falling from height and sustaining severe injury. Now, a major trauma centre in Perth would include Royal Perth Hospital, who have the capabilities and facilities to uh, manage and treat those major traumas. And being transported to an emergency department is associated with being an older adult, female, falling from standing or low height and sustaining less severe injuries. So this is our population of older females who are more likely to be having trips and slips more frequently and being transported to their nearest emergency department. And the older adults are more likely to be attended repeatedly and not transported. So an interesting side note of the 115 sources is their highly variable definition of a fall. So where most falls are defined by uh, their mechanism or location, these 115 sources identified two high risk subgroups, which included elderly or older fallers and repeat or frequent fallers. Thank you. Now, this figure is showing how many of the 115 sources reported on each of my four conceptual categories. So moving from left to right, we can see that patient characteristics are quite well reported in pre-hospital literature regarding sex and age, although comorbidities is underreported. And this highlights the first gap in literature that I aim to fill with the cohort studies that I'm completing. Mechanism of fall and type of injury are quite well reported throughout literature, but we can see in the third column that only 44 of the 115 sources reported on paramedic and pre-hospital interventions, highlighting the second gap that requires more information and a gap that I look to fill with my cohort study. So although not reported uh, that much, we can see that life supports, medication, immobilization, and lifts and extractions are the primary themes within uh, pre-hospital interventions that require more information. And in the final column, we can see that transport and destination are quite well reported in pre-hospital literature, but the final gap is that non-transport and referral pathways require a lot more research. Next slide, please. So this is a brief overview of the data set that I'm using to complete both of my cohort studies. We can see uh, all ambulance attended adults who fell between 2015 and 2020. And we can see that the number of falls requiring an ambulance is increasing each year. Although these falls are accounting for a similar percentage of the annual EMS workload year to year. And as of January, February next year, I'll include the 2021 data. So cohort study one is looking at all falls from January 1st, 2015 to December 31st, 2020. And within this study, I'll be looking at those four conceptual categories, the patient characteristics, injuries, interventions, and patient disposition. So this is a lot of text, but we're gonna go through it. So for each of those years of data, they have undergone a rigorous data cleaning process. So my supervisor and I would start with all WA ambulance records for that given year. We would then remove standbys, blood transports, motor vehicle or cardiac related events, leaving us with all coded falls within the medical priority dispatch system and all falls that were described as a fall within the paramedics examination text. And by including both, we know that we have included all fall incidents for each year. Uh, children were then removed from the data set as my research focuses exclusively on adults who fall. Uh, backup ambulances were identified and all non-fall cases and incidents were removed leaving me with all attended fall incidents in adults for that given year. Leaving us with all included falls over the last six years. So you can see that there were more than 22,000 uh, individual patients who fell and required an ambulance in 2015, more than 24,000, 2016, 25,000, 2017, 
more than 26,500 in 2018 and 19, and nearly 30,000 in 2020, leaving me with a data set of nearly 155 people who fell in Western Australia and required an ambulance. So when a patient falls and triple zero is called, the Ambulance Communication Centre will collect details through the medical priority dispatch system and allocate a priority at which the ambulance needs to be dispatched to the patient. So 19% of ambulances were dispatched via priority one, the highest priority with lights and sirens, which is an immediate dispatch to a potentially life-threatening emergency. And we can see in the middle of the graph here that most ambulances were actually dispatched to patients via priority two, uh, an immediate dispatch to an urgent incident with no immediate threat to life at normal road speeds. Now, we can also see by the graph that males more frequently required a priority one ambulance, while females more frequently required a priority two and three. And this reinforces how males tend to fall from height and sustain more severe injuries, requiring the higher priority, while females tend to fall from standing, fall more frequently and sustain less severe non-life-threatening injuries. So looking at the demographics of this six years worth of data, 90% of patients who fell and required an ambulance were over 50 and 71% were over 70. So we know that when people are well, we know that people who are falling and requiring an ambulance are largely our older population and more commonly are female. So this butterfly chart shows a highly significant association between age and sex in the number of ambulance attended falls. And this is consistent with the most up-to-date research suggesting that falls as a mechanism of injury largely impact older adults. And we can see by this graph that males and females 85 to 89 sustain the highest number of ambulance requiring ambulance attended falls. Now, this data is showing that when comparing males and females 49 years and under, there is no significant difference between the number of ambulance attended falls. But when comparing males and females 50 years and over, there is a highly significant difference in the number of ambulance attended falls. So not only are older people falling more frequently, but older women are falling significantly more frequently than older men requiring more ambulance attendances. So when paramedics arrive to the patient, the patient is given a GCS score or a Glasgow Coma Scale score which is a score between three and 15, 15 being the highest or the most alert and responsive, and three being the lowest, based on three categories, best eye response, best verbal response, and best motor response. Now, focusing on best verbal response, patients that were fully orientated, receiving a score of five out of five, made up 79% of patient cases. While being confused, a four out of five was the most common verbal response condition paramedics in WA recorded when attending adults who fall. And this was most commonly experienced when attending adults 85 to 89 years of age in both males and females. Now, this can include a patient not knowing what day it is, general confusion when answering questions, and can create difficulties when paramedics are attempting to discover the mechanism of a fall, the number or types of medication a patient is taking, how long a patient has been on the floor for, or if they are experiencing acute or chronic pain. So 42% of patients received a medical intervention, and today I just want to talk about analgesia or pain relief. So we can see that uh, fentanyl citrate, which is an analgesia, was the most commonly administered treatment, which is usually given intravenously or via IV. Methoxyfluorine and fentanyl, so our inhalation analgesia, you may have seen the green whistle, um, or oral tablets of paracetamol. So we know that analgesia or pain relief is the most commonly administered uh, pain medication. And something that's really nice to see is that the effect is most often good, partial, or successful. Now, as highlighted by the scoping review I went over earlier, this area of interventions and this 42% of patients are going to comprise a large part of my research in reporting results of what's going on there because we know this is a gap. 
So once paramedics have attended and assessed the patient, they decide what urgency to transport the patient to hospital via. Now, remembering that 19% of ambulances were dispatched to patients via priority one, only 1% 1 of patients were transported to hospital via urgency one with those lights and sirens. So this is highlighting how, firstly, falls have the potential to cause injury from low to less threatening severity. And secondly, once paramedics arrive, uh, they are able, patients are able to be treated, stabilized, or are just not injured to a point where they require urgency one lights and sirens transport to hospital. Now, patients who fell were most frequently transported by urgency three, meaning treatment is ideally starting within 30 minutes due to a moderate trauma such as a limb fracture, which is a non-life-threatening injury. Now, as I mentioned previously, males are more likely to fall from height and more frequently requiring that priority one attendance. And we can see by this graph that males more frequently were transported by urgency one, while females were more frequently transported by every other urgency. So nearly 12,000 patients were not transported over the six year period, and females were more frequently not transported compared to males. Now, non-transport can be due to a refusal to travel, uh, a patient requiring lift assistance and no medical intervention, uh, or a patient simply does not require emergency transport to hospital. Uh, but non-transport and non-conveyance rates are highly variable within literature, and this is another one of those gaps identified in the scoping review that requires a lot more research into our rates of non-transport and our reasons for non-transport. So my second cohort study is looking at all repeat falls in Western Australia from January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2020. Now, 2015 comprises my non-appearance period where I'll be excluding patients before I start to include them as I don't want to include people who are already in the middle of their pattern of falls. So between 2016 and 2020, I will be identifying a patient's initial index or first fall, and then assessing the 12 months post that initial fall to see if and how many subsequent falls that same patient has. Again, looking at those patient characteristics, injuries, interventions, and disposition. 2021 will comprise my final follow-up period for any initial or index falls that happened in 2020. Now, this study is still very much in the data identification and cleaning stage, so I'll be able to share some more results with you next year for this particular study. And on to the qualitative phenomenological study, where I have 12 semi-structured interview questions covering those four conceptual categories I've been talking about, where I'm looking to explore the experience of paramedics attending and managing patients who fall. I'm interviewing paramedics with at least one year's on-road experience working in WA in both metro and regional areas. I'm looking to conduct 15 to 30 interviews and I've conducted 11 so far. And I'll be interviewing into roughly March next year. So as I have been transcribing and searching for those emerging themes in the 11 interviews, uh, I have created roughly 12 to 15 themes, but these are just a few that I'd like to share with you for now. So the first theme is paramedics' perception of their role. Paramedics feel, some paramedics feel that they are stuck in this binary of are we an emergency service or are we a health service? Whereas other paramedics feel it's more of a spectrum and they have to sit somewhere in the middle to be very holistic in their view of their patients. In terms of referral pathways, paramedics feel that there could be more in that pre-hospital setting uh, because they feel that they are exhausting the few options that they do have currently. And they're really passionate about this because they want to support patients' independence. Paramedics are fully aware that most of the people they're attending for falls are our older adults and they want to maintain uh, their independence, keeping them in their home, but they feel that they require more assistance with this happening. So I'd just like to share two quotes with you from some interviews so far. 
I'd like to have some clarification on whether or not we could be the clinician to sign off on that referral pathway. That would be really good. You know we've got a secondary triage team. If we could get a better relationship with Silver Chain as well. It's not that we don't have a good relationship, we just exhaust their resources often. So if we could work in better partnership with them a lot more, that would be great. Whether it be, we can treat a skin tear. We've got no other obvious injuries we can see. If we could get an after hours contact with Silver Chain, is it somebody that can do this? You know, a skin tear dressing. It would reduce the number of presentations to hospital. Now you drag them down to hospital where they're going to sit either on the ramp or very rarely in the waiting room. If they're younger, they might go into the waiting room, but they're going to wait for a long time to be seen if there's nothing outwardly wrong with them. So there's a bit of an ethical dilemma there. Yeah, certainly I was surprised when I started this job, how many people we don't leave at home because there's nothing wrong with them, but we take them just in case. Now, both of these quotes really come back to those gaps in research in the scoping review, looking at uh, non-transport and referral pathways. It's not necessarily that by researching non-transport, we're going in with any kind of objective or agenda to say it should be one way or the other, but more looking at the effective transport um, of patients. And if they're not needing to be taken to the emergency department, but they also can't be left at home, where do we link up in the middle? And that's what I'm hoping to fill in more with cohort studies. So I just want to recap a few of the uh, main points from today. Uh, the older adults and females comprise the highest proportion of ambulance attended falls in WA. Just about one fifth of ambulances were dispatched as a priority one, and confusion was a common verbal response after falling. 19% of ambulances were dispatched to patients with lights and sirens, but most patients were attended by a priority too. After treatment, only 1% of patients were transported to hospital via the highest urgency, but most patients were transported via urgency three. And one in 11 patients roughly were not transported. So ultimately, there is a lack of pre-hospital research uh, and literature regarding the pre-hospital interventions, non-transport and referral pathways regarding uh, patients attended for a fall. And I'm looking to quantitatively address those gaps with the mass numerical data from the cohort studies and qualitatively address and explore these gaps with the textual interview data from the paramedics. So ultimately, I'm looking at ambulance attended adults who have fallen and looking at the who, what, where, when and why of the pre-hospital setting in order to address those gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paige. That was really interesting. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? 